So I'm here to talk about core boot on the RISC V. I had a couple, I had a really good question this morning called why do you even want to bother with core boot? Can't we just start the kernel? And that's what I thought when I started this project in 1999. I had systems that I could, you know, get the firmware to get the hardware working in about 100 instructions in 1999. And, uh, you know, that hardware is all about the stuff that's outside the CPU. So all the talks this morning were kind of about this CPU, this RISC-V. The stuff that's outside the CPU now takes about a billion instructions to get right on a Chromebook, which is about as simple an x86 chipset as you're going to imagine. So we've gone from 100 to a billion, you know, in 12 years. Uh, Moore's Law in reverse, maybe. Things get worse. So <laughs> this is really about the stuff that has to run before your kernel can even do anything. And in the early days of Linux BIOS, which is what this was called when I started it, I thought, I'll just put Linux in Flash and it'll work. So I learned the hard way that wasn't right, but I never expected I would be at a billion instructions before that could work. So we're going to talk about what firmware is, what core boot is, why we'd like to have it on the RISC-V, and then, um, you know, history and structure and lessons learned. And I'm going to try and focus mainly on status and lessons learned, so I may skip a few slides, but they're in the slide deck, so you should be able to see them. And I'm going to start with the PC, even though, you know, there was firmware before the PC. It's just that nobody really realized it. Um, and firmware in, in the 1974 PC era was the bottom half of your operating system. So you had this ROM, this gigantic 8 kilobit ROM on your motherboard. And it had entry vectors, and your operating system would call it. And so the operating system had an abstracted floppy disk, and it would call things in this, in this part and that implemented the real floppy disk. So I could run on an MSI or an Altair or anything I wanted to, same floppy, different hardware, but the abstraction was maintained on the motherboard. Um, that's why you could run CPM on all those different 8080-based you know, and Z80-based systems, and it sucked. You know, it was really slow. Um, there's no easy bug fix path. You've got your board. You're really, eh, eh, you're probably not going to reprogram that EEPROM, and it wasn't SMP capable. None of this really mattered. Uh, back then, but it started to matter later. Fortunately, by 1990, we had wonderful buses, well, you know, a little bit later. We had wonderful buses like PCI, and we could do this fire and forget where we just, the BIOS would set up the bootloader and disappear, right? So once your kernel was running, the BIOS was completely out of the picture. And all the BIOS really needed for something like Linux or BSD was set up the stuff their kernels can't do and, and that get gone. And Linux BIOS is one example of that. Linux BIOS is only function was to get the hardware ready for a kernel and then start the kernel and then disappear. This is great, right? You could, you could boot a complex server node to Linux in like three seconds. That's what we did at Los Alamos where I did a lot of this work in the early days. And we built full HPC systems based on this model. Um, and you know, we've progressed a lot because in 2015 on nodes I have the run EFI, I can do the same thing in 300 seconds. So you know, again, it's not a factor of a lot, but it's still a couple orders of magnitude. Star Wars theme, right, because Star Wars. Uh, so 2005 on, uh, things kind of went in the wrong direction from my point of view. So our kernel's in ring zero, so we were stuck for a ring numbering, so we said, oh, well, hypervisor is ring minus one. Well, unfortunately, the firmware doesn't go away anymore on those platforms. It's still there. It's there when you press a button to turn the thing off. It's kind of always with you, unfortunately. And um, it sucks. It still sucks, right? It's kind of slow. If you're on an x86, um, like an AMD or an Intel AMD x86-64, when you hit the power button and it goes into this sort of firmware management mode, all the cores stop but one, which is kind of insane. If you have a machine with a lot of cores, you might want to have. And um, if you're on a machine like an Itanium, like uh, Lawrence Livermore had on one cluster, well, you know, you might have two processors enter this sort of maintenance mode stuff that's running in, as we call it, ring minus two, and it's not SMP safe, and then your nodes crash every time two things happen to enter that. And they would enter it if you got a double ECC, you know, an incorrectable ECC fault. So I, I don't like this model. I wish it had not come back. It has come back. Um, and it's even being pushed now for ARM V8. So why don't I like persistent firmware? Um, it's another attack vector. That's been demonstrated time and time again in the last few years. Um, it's indistinguishable from a persistent embedded threat because if this stuff is running, you don't know what it's doing. Is it an exploit? Maybe. Or is it not an exploit? You really can't tell. Um, and I don't think it's necessary in an open source world. So my preference is fire and forget as opposed to it's always with you. 
Um, and if you look at the low risk machine, I think the minion cores are actually ideal for that, right? So all the things we do today with like a management engine in the Intel case or an embedded controller on your laptop, these weird separate out of band processors running code that you don't have any control over, in my view, go to low risk and look at those minion cores and those things are your maintenance things. And they're running actually kernel threads and those maintain your platform. So, you know, fire and forget from my point of view is what you want. So where does Coreboot come into this? This is a GPL v2 BIOS replacement. We started at Los Alamos in 1999. It began as Linux BIOS because the original model for the first couple of years is um, you actually embed Linux in Flash. Some people still do that. And you, know, you, you start your kernel, and in the HPC case, we use Linux to boot the real Linux that ran on the supercomputer. We renamed it to Coreboot in 2007 because Sun and Microsoft said they didn't want to work with a product that had Linux in the name. Uh, and they said, oh, we'll start using it if you take that Linux name out of it. So we took the Linux name out of it and they never used it anyway. Well, what are you going to do? Um, it's mostly C with a very small amount of assembly and ACPI source language. We use kconfig and kbuild. It builds in about 10 seconds for RISC-V. I just had to, tested that again this morning. And it's got this high-level organization in the source tree that's around the block diagram. So I'll show you that in a minute. It is very, very definitely not a bootloader. It's designed to either load a kernel from Flash or load a bootloader from Flash, but we very, very carefully restrict what it does to doing almost nothing and getting out of the way. This is sort of a diagram of how things can boot in Core Boot. So you see Core Boot there, and then three payloads, either Philo, which is a Lilo with all the BIOS calls removed, this thing called CBIOS, which is a box BIOS rewritten in C. So if you ever wondered what CBIOS means, the S-E-E-A means letter C, as in written in C and depth charge, which is a, what we use on Chromebooks for what we call verified boot. So there we see booting Linux, Windows, and Chrome OS. So why bother? Why do this? Well, Core Boot is actually rapidly becoming a standard in a lot of consumer hardware. Um, all the Chrome OS, any Chrome OS thing you ever see since 2012 runs Core Boot, which means half of all the educational devices in the US, it turns out. We've got a really good verified boot solution, so you can guarantee that you're booting what you should have been booting. It's all signed at every level. It's really well worked out. We've got a nice recovery and update model, so there's a million Chromebooks out there and we need to do an update of the firmware. We can actually do that safely. That's worked very well now for several years. Uh, and I see that as being very good for an Internet of Things, and maybe one Internet of Thing you, you can think about is the new router that Google released a few months ago. So I see it as open source firmware for an open source CPU. I started the port in October 2014. That was mainly tool chain and utilities. The RISC-V guys did a fantastic job on getting the tool chain working well for us. Um, first QMU boot was about six weeks later in between me starting it and me ending it and went off on travel and did a bunch of other things. So really, it, it could have really been done in about a week. Um, and I'll break down sort of what the tasks were in a few slides. Uh, they came out with the nice privilege model last year, about May or June, and I had a great intern from Stanford who spent two months getting that up and got it all working again in, in September. So that was changed everything. Tool chain, I mean, there wasn't a single thing that didn't change with that change. The first port runs on QMU. The QMU doesn't do the privilege model yet, so the second port runs on Spike. Uh, I'm looking forward to getting that QMU back. Um, you've got to use the 5.2 version of GCC. But I think the really important thing is uh, the RISC-V support went up in 11, you know, November 2014. Um, there is not a commit of the 5,000 commits that's been made to Coreboot since then that's allowed to break that, that support. In other words, RISC-V is a first-class citizen. Nobody gets to break it just because they want to add some feature to ARM, right? It's there and it's well supported. And that was really important to make sure that happened. So every time a commit goes into the core boot repo, there's a full build done of all targets in the core boot tree, which is about 250, 300 of them now. One of those is risk five, and it has to work. So the basic structure, um, so every, all the source, top level source starts in a directory called source, not surprisingly. And you kind of start from the main board and work your way down. So there's source, main board, emulation. Emulation is a vendor type. Spike risk fee is an instance of, 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 a, of a board from the vendor emulation. You know, normally it'd be source mainboard Google or source mainboard Samsung, but we grouped emulation in one thing. That point, that actually imports a thing from the source system on chip directory, source SOC, we call UCB the vendor in this case, risk five. 
That points to an architecture directory, search, source arch risk five, and then the rest is common code. So it's kind of three directories that are specific to risk five, and the rest is just core boot. This is what it looks like, sort of drilling down a little bit. This is the emulation spike risk v. You can see there's just like, in generally, not a lot there, a few .c files, and spike util is sort of how we talk to spike to do things like serial IO. Um, the system on chip, there's almost nothing there at all. It's just some glue. This would grow a lot bigger when we get to real hardware, which I'm hoping we're gonna do this year. Um, and this is where a lot of the meat of this thing is, source arch, source arch risk five. Um, notice we have stuff in there like exception handling. You can see include arch arch.h. Um, the very early assembly code, which is usually about 10 lines on these ports, the rest of it is C. And um, that's kind of about it. One of the things we do when we start, because the, the alignment traps kind of came and went as we were doing this project, we actually force a couple traps to make sure our exception handling is working. So part of the startup is to deliberately cause a trap to happen, make sure we catch it correctly and continue. And that's been handy because, again, sometimes the exceptions on alignments would come and go, and we had to make sure they continue to work if they came back. So all the C for this target is 10,000 lines of code. Um, all the RISC-V sources, about 900 lines of code. I'm just counting C, not H. Uh, the port effort is in those files you saw, and the rest was unchanged. Now, I have to be honest, we had, we had PowerPC and Alpha working in 2001. Those kind of fell by the wayside, and we picked up some 32-bit-isms and some byte ordering problems, which we fixed. So you know, the rest is unchanged functionally. There were probably 10 or 20 instances of, of non-cleanness and sort of 64-bit isms and that sort of thing. All right, so there's always this question of QA. You've got a board, you've got a port, you think it runs, you're not sure at all times that it runs, what do you do about that? Uh, the Federal Office for Information Security in Germany actually runs, and you can go and check it out, that website. Uh, the BSI actually a couple of years ago when they started fielding systems with their armed forces in Afghanistan decided that they could not risk having laptops that ran binary blobs and firmware that they didn't have control over. And they essentially said that from now on when we field stuff it's going to run core boot. So that's been there for about eight, eight, nine years now. That's resulted in some very interesting discussions and interactions with Intel as you can guess. But each time it's come away with, you know, core boot, all open source based firmware winning. Um, anyway, they've set up a number of hardware test stations that can, they can automatically flash, so they can do a build, flash, reboot, check serial outputs all the way up to Linux, all the way up to running regression tests in Linux and making sure that everything still works. Um, that's really a very powerful thing to have. And they basically have said that as soon as I've got RISC-V hardware, that I can tell them how to buy from wherever I buy it, uh, they're gonna set up a test stand for RISC-V. And they're willing to do multiple of these. So essentially the German government has said that they will be happy to validate RISC-V hardware running core boot for us and Linux. So you can see the information on the test stand is from a company called Raptor Engineering that kind of makes their living doing core boot. Um, so my reasoning here is if you're gonna do a system, you need firmware. We've talked about the architecture this morning and specific CPUs, but firmware is about the stuff that's not the CPU. That stuff is always complicated, it always has bugs. Linux actually doesn't know how to turn this stuff on because it's generally not dropped into a system with this stuff off. So Linux, for example, can not actually configure non-configured PCI interfaces correctly. It's one of the first things I learned in 2000. So you really kind of, I view it as a necessary evil. I want it to be gone when I'm done booting. That's the model I believe in. Um, you know, maybe uh, there is some stuff that has to persist. What I would argue then is if you need something to persist sort of in this very high level protection ring, which I guess is ring three on risk five, I always get them backwards, you know, the most privileged ring, that should be something your kernel installs in that or, or provides to that in some way. I don't really want it left there by firmware because I can't tell if it's an attack or not. I think it should be something I own. Uh, but anyway, if you're gonna do a system, you need firmware. If you're gonna do firmware, might as well be core boot. This is my biased view. Um, but if you do that, you get a free hardware test stand and you don't have to pay for it. German government will pay for it. That's kind of a neat thing. You know, if, anyway, if, if you can ever spend someone else's money, don't ask questions, just do it. So status, we did two ports with a few weeks work. The, the guy I got from Stanford didn't know, you know, firmware from a hole in the ground. Um, 
Of course, he was a smart guy, so he kind of ramped up, but he had to do a lot of work, and he, had to, and he wasn't afraid to dig, but it was still quite an effort. Uh, we booted a QMU in the first port. The second port boots to, on Spike to Linux. Um, it had to do additional stuff, right? Set up the paging, set up the privilege levels, do the transition to the outer privilege level for Linux, that kind of stuff. That all works. Um, and that can't be made to break, right? That's part of the tree. You don't get to break it because you want some feature in your arm, V, whatever. Okay, you can't break risk five. That's kind of the rule. All right, so there's a couple of lessons we've learned over the last 16 years, which I wanted to throw out because we've got a lot of good systems builders here. Um, you know, your various arms give me a boot time SRAM. It's really nice, 348K or whatever on some of these arms. One thing that's really key is make sure, it, if you can, that it's kind of somewhere known. That helps a lot. Even more importantly, please don't alias it by DRAM once DRAM is up. So it's kind of nice to have it there even after you turn on DRAM. And the various, some of these various ARM socks do that. Uh, on the x86, we have RAM running, you know, we, we can build RAM out of cache. It's called cache is RAM. But as soon as you turn memory on, that's, that memory kind of vanishes. And that's painful. So if there's a way to do it this way like the ARMs do, that'd be great. Um, I just had this discussion with Tim. I think he's not totally in agreement with me on this, but just give me a serial port, right? Just please, just bring out one pin. It can be the worst serial port in the universe, OK? It can be fixed at some baud rate, 115.2. Make it miserable for me. He's kind of halfway convinced I don't want that. Me, I don't want that, but I can't quite convince myself I don't. Uh, I can't recommend more strongly that you, you just give me this thing. It can be all output, even, right? Output only is fine. But this saves a huge amount of time in bring up. I mean, literally can save months in bring up. Um, runtime functions that you trap to for whatever reason, in my opinion, ought to be in a kernel. And I, this is why I'm so excited about the minion cores, because to me, they seem like the ideal way to solve this problem. Not everyone in the core boot community agrees with that, by the way. There's a, there's a friend of mine who implemented the system management mode in core boot, and he argues with me all the time about this. Um, Firmware tables always need translation by a kernel. So as long as we're starting clean, maybe we can start a little cleaner than we have. Make them text, not binary. So there was a table in the various Intel processors called the NP table. And it was a binary table, and it had a version in it. There were precisely two versions of that table, 1.1 and 1.4. No one ever moved beyond that, because it's friggin' impossible to change a binary table once you've got enough code out in the wilderness, right? Just make them text. The kernel is going to interpret them anyway. And, and think in terms of, you know, you're, this is going to be C code, not assembly code, parsing the table. Don't spend a lot of effort making it easy to parse it in assembly. It's wasted time. Uh, ACPI spent a lot of effort to make things easily parsed in assembly, and nobody cares. Um, the open firmware tree is not bad. Actually, some work I've been doing recently on two different operating systems projects. We decided to go with JSON, because JSON works, and it's dead simple, and anything can parse it. Uh, Mask ROM, uh, every, all these ARMs have mask ROMs. They got a full USB stack inside. I can't totally convince myself that's a good idea, but it's there, but maybe you don't want to do that, right? Maybe you want to think about some way to load a new BIOS image that doesn't involve a USB stick and maybe involves some kind of lower complexity protocol like SPI or something. Um, if you're going to do a board, throw some network hardware on there, make it a really dead simple network chip because the test stand requires it. So maybe the first board you do. This is a huge problem with, with TIO map. A bunch of TIO map boards did not have a network chip on them. They wanted you to put a USB stick in for network. That made testing just a ton harder. So, so throw an RTL 8169 or 8111 on there for your first iteration, or just some kind of simple NIC that lets us wire you into a test stand easily. Oh, don't cheap out on Spy or flash part size. Probably nobody's going to like this suggestion, but man, just, just plan for a big damn flash part. You will not regret it. You will regret it if you plan for 4 meg. I can guarantee you that. Um, 8 sounds big until you really need to put some stuff in there. Just, just go for something big. Um, this is a funny one. Um, OK, I have just about enough time to tell this story. For the past 38 years or so, there's been an I.O. port on PCs, port 80. You just, you just push 8 bits out to it, right? And, and normally, there's nothing there to receive it. It goes to air. And actually, the card that receives it is designed that way, to never respond to an I.O., but it grabs it and displays it in two hex digits. 
Anyone who's seen a motherboard with the two hex digits on it that, that rotate and change value as you turn it on, that's the postcode. Uh, that was inspired by IBM mainframes, believe it or not. Every I.O. chip built for the last 38 years knows that if, if, if like you go to 80 and it doesn't respond, just it's OK. It's good. We will not blow up and explode, except Intel's Cave Creek chipset. So the 11th instruction in Core Boot is a post to port 80 of an 11 to kind of say I'm here, and the Intel Cave Creek chipset immediately resets and blows up and dies if you do that because nothing responded to port 80. So think really, really, really hard about your I.O. chipsets what they're going to do in the early going, OK, when the system's not really up. It was an easy mistake to make, and, and Intel got it right, except in that one chipset for like many, many years. But it's a warning that I thought I'd throw out there. So RISC-V needs firmware. We've got open source firmware ported today. We've got it ported to the new privilege model. Um, it's the same firmware used in millions of consumer and embedded systems, laptops, tablets, routers. There's a lot of places it's used people don't know about, like the iRobot PackBot uses it. Uh, that's the one that goes out and gets blown up by mines, which is preferable to getting people blown up by mines. Um, it's in digital TVs. It's just, it's, it, I mean, I, if I wanted to go out and hunt down people who were violating the GPL, I guess I could, but I don't care, but it's many, many places. We've got this really good verified boot model, courtesy of Chrome OS, and um, these update models. Despite a lot of efforts by people, the verified boot, I think, has only been broken once by Pinky, and it was a bug that somebody inserted in a script. And that's about it. I was trying to make sure I didn't run over. I don't think I did. Any questions? Hi. So uh, John Masters, Red Hat. Um, yeah. I was one of the people that um, pushed for um, all those things on ARM V8 that you didn't like. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> so, Sorry. Uh, so, but I think the point I wanted to make and just maybe get, give you a chance to have a response to is that it does depend on the target audience. So uh -huh. when we're talking about ARM V8 and talking about servers, and my perspective with RISC-V is very similar, mm -hmm. um, I am very interested to see options for stable platforms that exist so that if there is going to be a, a mainstream uh, pre-built, pre-compiled operating systems that run for many years yeah. of the kind that we see on servers in the mainstream, um, we do need to have some of these stable platforms. We do need to have things like SMI. We do need to yeah. have, and, and you and I both know this. I so. think you know better than me, honestly. Right. And, and this is, um, I should say that Corbett demonstrated the first open source SMM in yeah. running in 32-bit mm -hmm. mode. I, I'd have to say of all the things I really feel strongly about, that's the one I feel least strongly about. But okay. I still, it leaves me uncomfortable. So let's and, agree and, that different, yeah. different target markets and maybe we should just you know, make sure we can address both is, is, is what I'm trying to say. Can't argue with you. Okay. Yeah, I think cool. you're right. Thank you. Hi, Sam. Um, I have no particular corporate affiliation. Um, so you mentioned that the purpose of core boot is to bootstrap whatever host OS you're running and then get out of the way. That was the early goal, and but this, I just, I'm sorry, I just blanked on your name. Um, John has pointed out, and as is true for Chromebooks, we, we can't, because we have to have system management mode handlers left behind. Okay, yeah. so that partially answers my question then, because I was gonna say, why so much code if it's just load and then disappear, but yeah. thank you. Um, now, the 10K for RISC-V, we don't leave anything behind, but it's just that there's a lot of generic pieces, and you know, they get compiled in. Um, one of those pieces is the thing that uncompresses the payload, because the relative bandwidth difference between flash and RAM is high enough that compression has always been a good, good thing to do. So there's an LCMA decompressed step in there. Yeah, Frank Perrin here. Um, does Coreboot uh, address PCIe enumeration and store off uh, things to give to the, the OS when it boots? Yeah. In fact, so my very first version of Linux BIOS, I didn't enumerate PCI because I said, oh, Linux will enumerate PCI. First thing that happens, first boot, Linux comes up and says, there's no PCI devices here. And that's when I learned the hard way that um, I was going to have to do it. So yeah, we do all the PCI enumeration and all this great setup. And we can actually even run option ROMs if you enable that. We actually will, will flip. I hate to, everyone hates to do this, but we will flip the 8086 mode, run the option ROM, and return. So yeah, we, we pretty much do everything. Um, the main thing we don't do nowadays is leave behind a bunch of interrupt handlers, classic BIOS interrupt handlers. 
Turns out CBIOS will do that if you want. So we even have that option in some cases. We do not handle those correctly, actually. I just found this out a little while ago. We do a lousy job with 64-bit with bars because we just haven't had any of them lately. Um, we started out as a server firmware thing, but the vendors, uh, you know, I think especially Intel, when they decided they wouldn't let anyone know how QuickPath worked, we ended up being kind of a laptop tablet embedded thing, and there just hasn't been any real need for 64-bit bars there. So that I just hit this last week and realized, goodness, it had 10 years and we still didn't get around to fixing that. So it, it's going to get done, but it hasn't been done yet. Hi, I'm Matt Weatherford from University of Washington. I'm just at, wondering if you could say a little more about the recovery and update model. Oh, that's actually kind of interesting because it's a philosophical thing that came with Chrome OS. So in Chrome hardware, there's this screw that locks down the write protect for the top two mega flash. And um, basically, in the very early going, in that very, very, very first step, and it's gotten a little earlier each time, there's a thing called the boot block that, that kind of looks in the writable part of Flash and makes a decision about whether there's a firmware image that should run in there instead of the one in the read-only. But the read-only is always read-only unless you crack the case open and remove that screw. And so the result is that the, the update is to the writable part of Flash, and then, and then Corbett will run the firmware in that writable part of Flash if it's there and if it passes the signature test. Otherwise, it'll fall back to the read-only part. So that's the model. This is a very different model from pretty much every other firmware, which um, tries to make it possible to update all of Flash. But every time somebody's tried to make that work, they've been exploited. So the decision was that the read-only part was essentially forever read-only. And if you ever took the screw out, then we basically throw up a screen that says, you know what, we don't know your state, then we can't pretend to boot a protected uh, OS image, but we'll go ahead and, and continue to boot.